Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's understand system design or software architecture for Yelp or Foursquare or TripAdvisor. Usually these systems are called as location-based services where the system design mostly uh, is similar for all of the system. The usual pattern or the requirements are where user provides a place name or GPS um, latitude or longitude and this system shows uh, the nearby restaurants or tourist place or attractions, um, something like that. Uh, also, these systems provides a way for user to upload some information or comments or rating or photos or something like that. So before understanding the system design, let's curate uh, the requirements, uh, functional and non-functional requirements, and also derive some capacity estimations. So let's understand functional and non-functional requirement for Yelp. So the functional requirements are the also called as business requirements are the first one is user should be able to have his own profile and he should be able to log in and log out from the system. And also he should be able to search any place, restaurants or tourist attraction if he is providing a place name or also by latitude and longitude. And this is very important. If uh, he is going to only provide the place, that means that if the system will take in a different direction, if we want to support a latitude and longitude capability also, the whole system design will be totally different. So the third one is uh, users should also be able to comment and rate that service or place or the event. And the fourth one is users should also be able to upload the photos. So, so these are the basic uh, requirements or the features for any location-based services. And the second one is the non-functional requirements. And these are also called as system design specific or software architecture requirements. So these are uh, pretty much easy if you think of. Um, so to understand more, you can read about 12 quality attributes of software architecture. These are obviously, these are the three top three ones and there are so many other, say for example, um, scalability, high, avail high availability, uh, reliability, fault tolerance, maintainability, testability, and so many others. others. And it's always good to understand what they do and uh, what are they mean for and how the system architecture will, will be implemented to uh, facilitate those. So in this case, the three important non-functional requirements are the system should be always high available, means that it should be available for user to access the information anytime they want. And the second one is scalable because these systems are um, doesn't always receive constant traffic. Sometimes this uh, system only receives high traffic during the tourist seasonal uh, seasons, uh, otherwise in the weekends or something like that. Um, so it should be scalable dynamically whenever we want to scale up or scale out, scale down or scale out. Uh, we should be able to do that. And the third one is low latency. That means that we should be able to access this information as fast as far as possible. That means that we should be able to access uh, these place or uh, specific restaurants information as fast as possible. Now let's understand how to estimate the requirements of data, IVO and the traffic. Um, to do that, you need to first thoroughly remember all the features which you are going to support. And for each feature, you need to also map what kind of data we are going to need and how we are going to save it. So for example, in this case, the main thing we want, we are going to store is the entries of the places. Say, for example, it could be a restaurant, a theater, or an event place, or it could be a tourist place. All of that follows a similar kind of data uh, structure pattern. So in this case, I call it as location entry, which basically has ID, name, category, you know, GPS uh, coordinates like latitude and longitude, description, and many other parameters. You don't have to consider all of them. You'll have to but consider all the key uh, parameters you need to store. So in this case, uh, ID, I might consider UUID. You can consider you know, an integer or something, but UUID, it's much unpredictable. Um, if it was an ID, it could be predictable. So it's better choice to consider UUID. And the name of the place, what kind of category, since, we, since we'll be having only limited categories, we might just need one byte of data to store. And then GPS coordinates, eight bytes and eight bytes. Uh, for latitude and longitude, we might need 16 bytes. And for description, it's up to you how much you want to support. Some of these um, decisions will actually be impacted by the business requirements. So, but in your interview, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can decide how much you want to give. 
uh, how much space you want to allocate for each kind of attributes. So not just these, it might go beyond uh, the list uh, which I have written here. Some of them are, say for example, to remember uh, is Oh, you know, opening hour of the event or the day, um, days at which these ev this event place is open. Say, for example, not all the restaurants are open always. They only may be functioning uh, six days in a week or something. So you need to store that information as well. And cost per person, menu of that uh, place, phone number, address, um, you know, landmark. And also, you know, might need a table for user profile. And also, you might need a table for orders, user behavior, comments, images, rating, coupons, campaigns. There are a lot of tables you need. So you don't have to consider all of them, but you just need to consider the key um, data tables uh, which you want in your system while you're designing. And then assign the size for each and every um, what you call uh, attributes and then compute the sum of all of these per entry. So once you get that per entry, let's say for all of this data, I'm just assuming one MB is my requirement. Say for every location entry, I at least need one MB to store all of this information. How did I get one MB? Uh, in this case, I'm just um, assuming that what you have to do is you have to add all of these numbers plus all of these numbers to get some number. Once you have that, what you need to do is you will also need to consider the number of entries which you are planning to store at that particular time. Say for example, this year, if you are planning to store about 100 million, that means that one MB into 100 million entries. So we might need one MB into whatever 100 million number comes back to. And also what you need to consider is for high availability, you will be replicating that data. That means that more than one copy of that data will be present anywhere for your system. So the number of replication factor, it will be definitely more than two or equal to two uh, and replicated across the region. So you will put that number over here, compute this formula, you will actually get the total data you require for the system. Sometimes some of this data, like user behavior data, uh, which you don't really might want need more replication. Maybe you just need to keep one more copy is fine. Maybe, but the crucial data you need to have more replication um, because of two things. One for uh, keeping the data safe and also high availability and also to facilitate much you know read throughput. The more number of copies of data you have, the more connection those databases can handle and you can have more read throughput and the latency will be less. So, so this is how you basically calculate. And also one more fact factor you can add is what is the uh, data you are going to add the next year or next quarter or next week or something like that. Right now I have 100 million listing or place or event location entries, but next year I might be planning to add another 10 million entries. So just compute the same formula for that and add that. So we might need um, that much uh, extra data space uh, in the next year, something like that. So this is how you basically compute the uh, data estimation. And one more thing you need to consider is how di choosing different kind of databases will impact on your data estimation. Suppose if you choose RDBMS, the RDBMS table the RDBMS tables are mostly normalized, so you won't have duplicate data present in multiple tables. But if you look at the NoSQL way of data modeling, we usually think that data is cheap and we keep more copy of the data in multiple tables based on the kind of queries we make. That all depends on data model. So you will have to think about that as well. If you're choosing NoSQL, maybe the same data is duplicated in multiple tables. So consider that as well. And also, why do you need to uh, understand the scale or the traffic estimations? Um, it also gives you a good idea of what kind of technologies you need to use and how you need to design your system. Suppose uh, if I have about 10 million users in my system and I can expect that out of 10 million users, uh, there could be that users of about 100K concurrent users at any given point of time in the busy hour of the day. So in that case, we know that for sure we will be getting 100K requests into our system. If you have chosen CDN, then most of the uh, requests will be handled by CDN. But still, what percentage of the request will be hitting your origin or the servers, actual servers, uh, apart from the CDNs? So that also gives you a clear understanding of how you need to do the system design. Um, 
And also the next thing is you need to also understand how much, how many of those API calls or the uh, requests coming into your server will result into querying the database. So that also gives you an estimation of query per second that you need to, you will only un understand all of these values once you have a little bit of understanding of what are the different APIs you're going to provide. It's also good to talk about that. For example, the APIs required here are login, logout, you know, resetting the password and the profile uh, related API, you can have one REST API to get all of these uh, information like uh, users info getting the user information, updating the user information, creating and deleting the user information all in one API. And also similarly, you might need a lot of different APIs to get the listing uh, of any particular place uh, to search or uh, to place an order or to contact that place uh, to get the contact information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are pretty much uh, common APIs you can list out. Based on those list of APIs, you will know how many of those uh, APIs will actually result into query and how many of those will go into cache. So based on that, you will know the query per second. And why is that so important for uh, understanding of QPS is to find what kind of database you need to use. If my query per second is too much high, then most likely that RDBMS will not scale to that factor. So it's good to go for NoSQL. And one more thing you need to understand is, uh, does your data really need consistency? Uh, in this case, if you look at the ELPS requirement, we don't need our listing data should be consistent because we don't really make too much of modifications to the data entry which we have for a particular place. So we usually create one entry for a restaurant. For example, if we create one restaurant entry in our system, it will most likely never change. Even if we change, it doesn't have to be really consistent way. Even if um, if it is delayed by a couple of seconds or if a user, if user sees old data, it's still fine. Um, it, is, it is not really that critical. So we can actually, uh, based on the non-consistency um, factor, we can choose NoSQL, otherwise we have to choose RDBMS. In this case, maybe for user profile information, you can use RDBMS. For all of the rest of the data, you can still go with NoSQL, so you will get the scaling performance um, or high availability all built in. So with all of the information we gathered so far, now it's the time to decide what kind of database we want to go for. Definitely we got to know that NoSQL will be a good matching for our system. And in that case, which is the specific uh, database or technology we should be choosing for. Two options here. The first one is MongoDB and the second one is Elasticsearch. You can use you know, Cassandra or any other thing as well, apart from MongoDB. But um, I am just want to, uh, Tell you the difference between these two. Uh, in case of MongoDB, the data is stored as documents. That is a good fit for our requirement because all of the data which is required for a specific uh, listing or a specific listing or a restaurant will be put into one JSON, which looks something like this. And apart from that, so MongoDB doesn't really gives you that full text search support. So that's not really good to go with that. So in case of Elasticsearch, we get the full text search support. Um, and also the other important thing is the second most important feature is search by location itself. Um, since we are storing the location information as latitude and longitude tuple or GPS information, we need our database to be able to search um, you know, nearby uh, restaurants or nearby places provided uh, my real-time location. For that, we need to choose a database which provides that. Surprisingly, MongoDB and Elasticsearch both provides that. In fact, MongoDB has a better support for that. Elasticsearch also does, but going with Elasticsearch has two benefits. The first one is you will get the full text sub search support. And the second one is we get the GIS support. So now we understand what is the benefits of using Elasticsearch over MongoDB. Uh, the other things to note here is Elasticsearch provides all the features which any NoSQL provides like auto sharding, uh, partitioning and uh, rich queries, uh, replication and all of that inbuilt. So you don't have to really worry about anything. But most people think that Elasticsearch is only used as a secondary storage where you have the main data in RDBMS or somewhere else 
And Elasticsearch is only used for searching purpose, where you dump the data and the Elasticsearch will build the index and then you use it only for searching. But that's not entirely true. A lot of system actually uses Elasticsearch itself as a primary data storage. Um, say for example, uh, all the e-commerce sites actually use Elasticsearch itself as the primary data storage where all of your product information is stored in the Elasticsearch itself, where you get the ID of the product and you can query and get that document as well and you can search using full text search as well. Um, in here as well, all the listing or the place information or restaurants, all of this information can be only saved in only one place that is where Elasticsearch. So you get two features out of it, full text search support and the second one is location-based support based on GIS. The peculiar thing about location-based is uh, this is the core of the system of any location-based services is given any GPS points, you need to find all the places which are near to your given location, uh, find all the restaurants or whatever based on your search criteria. So these kind of queries are actually kind of uh, have a good support in Elasticsearch. Um, so now the important thing we need to understand is uh, how how these uh, search queries are handled. All of that is uh, the APIs and everything is provided by Elasticsearch itself. You don't have to implement any of that. To understand more of how Elasticsearch itself works, you can uh, see one of my video which I have already made. I'm not going to talk about that. Now it's time to understand the system architecture for Yelp. So if you can see this complete uh, system design, uh, it's mostly self-explanatory. Um, if you have watched all of my videos in your in my channel, most likely you will easily understand all of this because in most of other videos, I have already spoken about all of these different components like API gateway, load balancers, Elasticsearch, um, firewall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this system, I'm going to just talk about the very important thing. If you look at the system, Yelp or Foursquare or any other systems, Usually they are read heavy system. The reason being is say for example, if you add a restaurant's information or a tourist place information, description photos and its opening timings or whatever information it is, uh, usually people browse through these pages and just read this content. There is nothing to modify uh, every day and every time. Um, the only time when the user modifies is when they add a comment or rate it, uh, something like that. But most likely, these entries are not modified. Uh, having said that, that easily gives a notion of read-heavy system. So uh, I don't know the exact ratio of read to write, um, uh, write to read ratio, but you can assume that it is pretty high. So that means that we have to design the system as a read performance system. So one way to do that is by using CDNs and caching mechanism. Uh, you can also use Redis to cache all of your API um, somewhere in here or here or wherever, but it is good approach to use CDN. So CDN uh, is, when the CDN is perfectly configured, CDN will take care of all the caching mechanism. Um, and one more thing you need to understand is how CDN works and how the requests um, are uh, landed in the CDN and how CDN gets the actual content from the origin server. Uh, you will have to make some DNS change to go make all the you know client requests to the CDN first and then CDN will actually get the requests um, content from the server if it is not cached. Uh, so one important thing you need to understand is how CDNs work. Um, suppose if your this is your Yelp's server, actual server, then the CDN servers are actually distributed uh, like a tree structure, say something like this. There's, there will be so many of them. Um, the You need to understand the hierarchy. Say, for example, if these couple of servers, there could be one or more, these couple of servers are in region level, so then these servers will be in a city level or um, a country level, or this could be in city level or ISP level. So what I mean to say is uh, they are usually laid out in a tree-like structure, say for example, this way. So this is called as origin server. Usually it's called as origin and they are like tree. 
So the user request will actually hit the very nearest edge server, which is usually present in your ISP's network. So it will check, um, the CDN edge server will check, have I cached the content for the request the user is asking for? If the cache is found, then they return it back immediately. If the cache is not found, they will ask the its parent server, do you have the cached um, response for this particular request? If that server has the cached uh, response, maybe it fetched uh, while giving it for this server or something like that. So if it had the cache content, it will give it back and then the request, the response is sent. If this server doesn't have, then it will request its parent. And if it doesn't have, it goes to the actual server or origin and get back all the requests back to the user. And once they come back, most likely the content is cached in all of these uh, uh, parent servers uh, up to these eight servers. So that's how the CDN works. And the next thing you need to understand is how photos are uploaded. The photos are actually uploaded in all into S3. So it will not be stored in the servers. It will be uploaded into S3. Two ways you can upload. One way is going through the API gateway or load balancer to your server from your server to S3. That's uh, not the advised way. Uh, you can directly upload from user uh, device directly to the S3 um, by using AWS SDK. That's also possible. The next thing you need to understand is if you look at the photos of um, yeah, if you look at photos of these platforms, they look much more appealing. Uh, not just food photos; it could be uh, tourist places, attractions, or whatever. Uh, users usually take a photo and then upload it directly without even editing it. So you can't just keep showing those photos because they are not much um, attractive. So what ELP does is they use machine learning techniques or deep learning techniques to enhance the uh, depth effect or the you know the vibrant make make the photos much vibrant by altering the saturation or applying some kind of filters. You can't just hard code filter for one kind of filter uh, or certain parameters um, uh, for, for altering the photos for every photo which user is uploading. It could it should be dynamic based on under based on certain parameters. Uh, you can read much about it on the ELPS um, engineering blog. Um, just saying you can use all of this technique uh, to enhance the photos. So the next thing you need to understand is uh, the usage of firewall. So when you use firewall, you can actually avoid cross-site scripting, DDoS attack, or SQL injection, all of these things. Also, uh, they usually allow geo-based blacklisting, or if you don't want to expose the service in specific countries because of some reasons, maybe because of um, data protection law, or you don't want to provide this service to some countries, you can block by IP or by geography region. The next thing they provide is rate limiting, throttling. You can try, you know, stop all the bots um, crawling all of your data, and also filter some of the request by uh, having, you know, rejects expression. So that's a kind of ability you'll get it from the firewall. Basically, this is uh, for the security purpose. So the next thing you need to understand is um, the Elasticsearch part. Uh, I'm going to discuss briefly about this um, after finishing this explanation. Um, we can uh, understand how the indexing for geospatial indexing works and everything uh, picturally on whiteboard. So the next thing you need to understand is the whole system. The system, you can build it using microservice architecture or service-oriented architecture. If you use microservice architecture, um, it's there will be so many services. Um, it could be pretty overwhelming to handle all of that, but you can uh, implement it via service-oriented architecture. That is much easier to implement than monolithic. Um, so the next thing is, um, how do you deploy all of these services? So the next thing is how your applications are deployed onto servers. Yelp uses uh, their own in-house solution called as Pasta, uh, which almost works like a Kubernetes, but uh, I'm not sure they're still using that or not. But you can use uh, Kubernetes to deploy all of these services where you will specify declarative way of how many servers you need, what is the CPU type, or what is the um, number, of, um, number of CPUs, or how much RAM you need, and all of this uh, thing, and also how many servers 
uh, should be up and running for a specific service. Maybe for user service, you can specify, I need 10 um, containers to be up and running. Uh, and also you can specify the auto scaling option. So you can scale by number of requests or you can scale by the amount of resource consumed. Uh, the other way to auto scale is uh, by using predictive scaling where predictive scaling also uses machine learning to analyze the uh, historical data and, um, and, and, and scale automatically. Sometimes when you know that uh, more users is going to come, sometimes we have to auto scale or uh, scale earlier uh, even before we are expecting the traffic. Say for example, uh, just to give an example in e-commerce world, uh, when you know that the sale is going to start tomorrow by from you know 10 a.m., that means that you should have already uh, have done the load testing on this system and understand how much request you it can handle with how many servers uh, or how many uh, containers by deploying how many containers. So that way, you know that, okay, if you're expecting N number of um, customers at 10 a.m., that means that you know exactly how much servers you need to be up and running uh, or how many containers you need to up and running. So that's like um, uh, preemptive um, scaling. So that is scaling even before the request starts coming in. So the next thing you need to understand is the usage of Redis. So Redis uh, is... Uh, Redis or memcached or caching is used for so many purposes. Uh, Yelp uses uh, memcached specifically than um, Redis for a couple of reasons. Um, some of the important reasons why they use memcached is because memcached is faster compared to Redis because it is multi-threaded. Uh, and also a couple of things are not really good in memcached, say for example, Memcache doesn't really support um, a lot of different data structures. Um, and also the value or the key value size is limited to one MB only, whereas in Redis you will be, you can store up to 512 MB. Um, another thing is Redis doesn't have its native clustering support, um, but you can do that using Redis Sentinel, uh, but Memcache does have all of this uh, clustering support. Um, those are the key differences you need to know uh, before deciding which one to, which kind of cache to use it for your system. So other interesting thing you need to understand is the step function. Say, for example, in our order management system, um, so this is what step, step function is all about. Usually we call these kind of strategies called as BPMN. Uh, please read about it if you don't know. Um, this is called as business, business process management notation, where you are going to mention the different steps uh, to be executed in, for any given process. Say, for example, in an order management system, the user will start uh, this steps or uh, process by submitting an order. Once the order is submitted, it should be processed. It looks like a flowchart for you. Um, usually, these um, uh, steps are actually created using a gra graphical tool um, where you can create these kind of diagrams. Usually how it works is each step is associated with one specific API. So all of this work will be performed, performed by submit order API. When the request comes in, this API will be kicked in and that will perform whatever it is supposed to. And once it finishes, if it successfully finishes it, uh, it will the, the, the message will be sent next to the process payment. And if that is successfully finished, it will be sent to uh, generate bill and it keeps on going. If in any step, if it fails, then basically it takes a different route. It simply looks like a flow diagram, but um, you will actually create it using a picture representation where different instances of this um, process uh, will be running for every order. Uh, you can call, you can think like a graphical way of representing a state machine. And you can also see uh, in the dashboard uh, what happened to a specific order and where and, and what is happening with that specific state. And you can also see where exactly is that specific uh, process happening right now. Is the customer still has to pay the payment? That means that the process would have ended up here. Um, you can you can read about it. I think uh, it takes too much of a time to explain these things. 
uh, please read about BPMN to understand about this even more. Amazon provides this service called as a step function, um, whereas there are so many other um, alternatives are there, something like Kamunda. So if you don't implement this one, if you don't have a pictorial way of representing, it is difficult to understand. And also, uh, it is very difficult to alter the insert some different flow or change the flow or do something like that. Or these kind of strategies will be much more useful in event-driven architecture. Um, and it is much scalable and it is much maintainable. Uh, please read about uh, BPMN to understand it even more. Yeah, so one thing uh, is load balancer, load balancer for database as well. This is for failover. Okay, if, if this database fails, then you will have a standby database which automatically the load balancer will be redirecting all the traffic to. So until unless this is working, all the requests will be going here. And once this fails, all the requests will be redirected to the standby. Um, this is, you can think like a master slave or you can have a active standby way of doing it. So the next thing you need to understand is, um, yeah, how the anomaly detection works or alerting system works. So what ELF has implemented is all of the logs from all of the system will go into a queue and then these data is consumed through Logstash and dumped into the Elasticsearch uh, database. And then periodically um, there are custom rules created uh, and then those rules will be keep on querying the data from Elasticsearch and keep checking is there any alert to be notified. Say for example, some of the rules uh, example are if error rate is increased by this many percentages, then trigger this alert. Or if uh, the number of requests coming into the system is increased by this much percentage, trigger this alert for some reason. It could be for scaling or it could be for alerting the admins to do something or manage something. Um, and, and especially if there is a if there is more number of 500s coming in, that means that there is something wrong with the system. That way you can alert um, someone who is responsible to handle that one. The other way to implement um, the order, sorry, the alert management system or alerting system is using queues where you have a streaming engine, something like Spark or Kafka Streams, uh, which keeps on doing the windowed operation. It could be a fixed window or tumbling window or something like that um, to keep on checking the rules uh, pre-configured rules on the input streams. The input streams is usually the, the logs which is coming into, which are parsed, and then you'll be looking for specific metric to trigger an alert. And the output stream will be usually alerts, will be sent into some kind of database. Um, usually the database are mostly time series um, TSDB, call it as time series DB, and from the time series, series DB, it will be consumed into the dashboards. That way you will see all the uh, alerts or the time series data and everything. And, and finally, one thing to understand is when you have these many systems in your um, whole architecture, say for example, you have a user, user profile service, rating, comments, order management, add, step, functions, and machine learning pipelines, and cluster manager, autoscaler, there are so many things, right, and the databases, and so many things. So when you have these many systems and when you are implemented using service-oriented architecture or microservice, the request comes in and those requests might be going into this service and going to this one, this one. Uh, there could be so many uh, microservice calls happening in the background. So how do you know who is causing problem or where are, um, why there is a high latency and which service is responsible for that? To understand that, there is a specific uh, standard way of doing it, also called as open tracing. Um, you can use uh, any of these tools to uh, trace all of your requests um, from different services to different services. In this example, if you see all of these services are listed here, they all, I took this diagram, I took this image from the ELPS um, somewhere, um, blog or somewhere, and then, so if you look at this, they have hided, hidden all of these um, services. So basically these are different services in in their system. If you look at the request has gone, taken total of um, some 1.768 seconds, but you can also understand here 
where and all the most of the time was spent. When the request comes here, it actually went to this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this service specifically took 66.18 millisecond, and all the requests, and this one is specifically taking 648 milliseconds and doing some get operation. And then there are so many ha things happening here. So this way you will actually, you can visualize that one API call is calling how many services and also which service is taking how much time or something like that. The important thing what you need to understand here is how these systems or even if you build your own uh, of Elasticsearch, how to handle um, these location-based search efficiently. Uh, for example, how do you index this data by location information that's latitude or longitude and facilitate a low latency search? Uh, you know how indexing works. I have already made videos on that as well uh, in how indexing works in RDBMS and how indexing works in NoSQL. All of that is already available. It basically use B-tree and ABL tree, all sort of that. But how do you make um, uh, indexes to do these kind of queries, the, you know, the range queries. Um, uh, basically, you'll have to find the nearby proximity queries or nearby queries using the GPS. Uh, all, all it boils down to searching points in the space, uh, given a point and given a radius, you'll have to find all the points which are intersecting. But if we look at the scale, we have about 100 million data entries in our system. You can't just linearly uh, search a uh, given point is it nearby to the other points which I have in our databases that will be highly inefficient. So let's understand how these uh, indexes are built in any system. It could be MongoDB or it could be Elasticsearch. Uh, that's very interesting feature. Let's understand that. Now these kind of problems is called as spatial search problem. There are a couple of algorithms which you can use to solve this particular problem. These algorithms are usually called as K nearest neighbor algorithms. The problem is pretty much simple. Say, for example, you are the person over here and you have a smartphone and you are in Yelp or you know, Foursquare or somewhere and you need to find the nearby restaurants and how your system should be able to find it. Uh, the one way to find it is, suppose if these are all the restaurants which are nearby and you are here and you want to find all the you are here and you want to find all the restaurants which are nearby you but within one kilometer radius then what you have to do is uh, picturally you will have one kilometer radius drawn around you and then you see that there are two restaurants which are in your area and then you will have to show this result but the problem is in your database you have hundreds of millions of restaurants and how do you actually figure out what are those two points which are near to the per this particular person the one way to do that is uh, finding the distance between you and all the points which you have in your system. How can you find uh, the distance is so you are a point and this is a point. To find the distance you can simply use Euclidean algorithm that's something like x1 minus x2 whole square plus y1 minus uh, y2 whole square right something like this. So using this formula you can actually find the distance between uh, you and that point you and this point you on this point, you on this point, all of these points. So you basically have a list of distance, okay? Next thing is you need to sort those distances and then you will have to get the top um, um, K number of uh, entries which are falling in the given radius of search. So if it is one kilometer and once you list and sort, you will basically uh, search all the k number of elements which are falling less than one kilometer so those are your search queries but the problem with this is if you have 100 million entries in your databases then you will have to compute 100 million distances for um, from the point where you are so for every query every user is making you will have to keep on computing these things the problem is you can't really cache these queries because if your lat latitude and longitude is say something like 8.1234, uh, comma 1.7312, and the next user, even though he's standing right next to you, his query parameter, the query value, the latitude, longitude, uh, may be something similar but changed by one decimal value. Even everything is same, 
same and if changed by one bit, uh, the query is totally uh, is off. So you can't really cache that uh, until unless the same user making a query from the same place, you can cache provided still if the uh, decimal points are not changed. So you can't really cache it. So you need, you need to have an efficient solution to find this uh, distances and then you filter out the top k elements by radius uh, from the user to that um, within that radius then how do you do that so definitely this is not the solution uh, even if this is a solution how do we make it uh, to query only the points which are nearby uh, and how do we find those points instead of searching everywhere how do we do that that's where the concept called um, uh, indexing comes into picture that specifically for uh, indexing for latitude and longitude uh, related indexing. Now, how do we solve this problem at scale? One formula you need to remember from your childhood uh, geometrical classes is that for any given box, you will have four corners and all of these four corners are actually represented by as X, Y coordinates, right? And if you give any point, if you want to search that point is inside that box or not, it is pretty much simple, which is very fast. All you have to do is compare between these all four different coordinates, whether they are falling in between or not. It's pretty much comparison of this. Um, if it is greater than this and less than this X and then uh, less than this Y and less than this Y, something like that, you will basically check can check this point is existing inside this box or not. So that's pretty simple. So using this trick, can we do something about it? Consider this the whole board itself is the world map and these are the points which I have in the system. I've written very less just to show you how it looks. And then now how do we, so if this person is standing over here, now at scale, we can't just come, you know, ca calculate the distance between this person and every point in this whole board because we have millions of them. Now, if we can restrict this user to only the nearest uh, space, then we can solve this problem by you know uh, we can reduce this problem by magnitude of uh, you know hundreds or thousands of magnitude so that gives you boost of performance by thousands of magnitude so how do we do that one simple trick is if you consider this whole board as a earth map map of the earth so we are we are we are having a two dimension representation and this is a y coordinate and this is x coordinate if you look at the latitude and longitude, this is simply an X, Y number. It's a coordinates only in a simple two dimension um, board. Um, so how do we uh, optimize this? One simple trick is, can we divide this earth into two different boxes? What, I, what, what will I do is, I'm gonna just divide this into two different boxes by drawing one big box here and another big box over here. So now I have divided this world into two different boxes. Now, if I want to search the query um, to find all the points near to this user, first thing what I have to do is, I have divided this entire earth into two different boxes. I know this coordinate, this, this, and this of the first box. And I also know this and this, and this, and this coordinates of the second box, okay? This is considered box one, and this is two. Now, all I have to do is, before calculating the distance between all the points which are inside this box, all I have to do is first check if this user's coordinate is inside this box or this box. This is just two operation. Once I do that, then I can keep computing all the points between uh, all the points which are inside this box. So you are reduce the problem problem by already by half of it. So if I had 100 million points, then we now with by dividing two boxes into two boxes, now we have reduced it to by 50 million. So half of uh, like it's the, the performance is improved by two times. Um, now what we can do is similarly, can we divide this into one more box, one more box, or maybe one more box inside here, one more here. So we have so many boxes inside here. And one trick here is you also need to remember the bigger boxes and the smaller boxes inside those things. So the bigger boxes is this one. And inside we have two boxes this one and this one and inside this box we have four boxes this one or maybe two boxes this one and this one and inside here there's one more box here one more here 
So it's the hierarchical representation of boxes inside boxes. So after dividing all of these boxes, how do we query the nearest points of this user? First thing what we have to do is like how we did it previously. First, take the point of this user, check with the bigger boxes and keep going inside those boxes. First, we had two boxes, the bigger one, this one and this one. Search with this box, is he there in this box or is he there in here? Definitely he is not in here. And but in this box, we know that he is here because with this four coordinates, his points are intersecting. And then what we have to do is go to the next bigger boxes. The next bigger boxes we have is this bigger box and this bigger box. Search it inside. So when we search here, he will not be here because his point is not inside here. So we know that he is not in this box and then search it in this big box. Okay, this one and then he, it intersects. And then what you can do is go to the next bigger box. The next bigger box is this one and this one. Search it in this two. We know that okay, inside here, he's not there. Once we know that inside here, he is not there, we don't need to search on these smaller boxes at all, right? So even if you have divided these boxes into another four, another four, and maybe inside here, another four, 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 four. Once we know that the bigger box itself is not intersecting with this person's point, we know that we don't have to search on any of these things, any of these smaller boxes. Now we can shift all of our concentration to just this box, okay? If this box was also divided like this, or this one also, what we have to do is search it in here if this point is intersecting in this big box we know it is intersecting and now we'll have to narrow it down to the smallest box where he is present now the next big boxes are this one and this one search it in here and in this big box we know that he is intersecting inside this big box and then keep narrowing it down and we find this box this is the very smallest box which we have drawn where he is intersecting and now what we can do is draw a circle around him say something like this okay and once we draw the circle we know all these points of the circle and then we can search for those points and find all the boxes which are intersecting like how we did it earlier and now we know that the circle is intersecting with how many boxes this box this box and this box in the corner this box and this box and this box that means that all of our search results are present inside this 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 box okay now we can calculate the distances like how we did it like um, euclidean distance square root of x2 minus x1 whole squ uh, square plus y2 minus y1 whole square and then we know uh, the distances and we can just sort by the distance and then take the top k elements so those are your search listing now, how do we save this box information? So the box information, if you look at, it's kind of hierarchical one, right? First, we divided this two into this one, the left and the right. And then we divided into another box, this side and that side. If you look at, we are kind of doing something like binary division, two divisions, so binary division, half here, half here. So if you look at, we can actually represent the whole thing like a tree. So first, we had a big box. We divided into small boxes. And then we divided this small box into another two small boxes. And then we divided it into a tiny small box. And then we made it into even smaller, even smaller and smaller and smaller. So now while we are searching, how do we search is if we get a point, search it in here first. It will definitely say that this point is inside this box because it, this is the bigger boxes which covers all of these smaller boxes. And now we have to narrow it down, just like how we do in binary search, it's something similar. Check this point here. If it is present here, then go to the next two uh, trees over here. Search here and search here. Now, the point cannot be existing in two different boxes because we have divided that way. And now that point exists here. That means that this entire problem is divided into half and then we have discarded. Now we have to narrow it down on the left side of the tree. And then you search in this leaf boxes. And then you will find that the point is intersecting either here or here. And now once we know here, this part of the tree is gone. We just have to search over here. Keep doing that. You'll basically find that respective small box by log n time, right? That's how the indexes for your latitude and longitudes are built. 
using the tree, you just you can just narrow it down to the smallest box where your specific points are intersecting. And once you find these boxes, and finding the boxes which intersect with the circle points is much easier. Um, so you, once you find all of these boxes, um, then you can figure out the very, you can, you're basically reducing the problem into very small space, and then you will have the listings. So now you understood the, uh, how the indexes work. And now how do we save all of this information, uh, all the points information in your database? Because you can't save all of this information, this whole thing into one database because we are operating at huge scale. Let's understand how can we uh, share this data into multiple uh, replication, uh, into multiple databases and do replication, all sort of that. So now that we understood how we can build the indexes for our latitude and longitude and make efficient queries of search listing, now it's the time to understand how we can maintain that data, that huge data, in, and provide higher availability also for your system. How we can do that is, we know that we computed all of the data, so if this was a word map, we divided into two big boxes first, and then into one more big boxes, boxes something like this, and then small boxes, something like this, right? Keep doing that. So now, anywhere when you want to provide high availability and also you know reliability and uh, replication, all of that, you, the only answer is by sharding. So in case of NoSQL, uh, the sharding automatically happens. Uh, it is inbuilt into the system itself by the sharding key which you specify in your data modeling. But in case of other system, if you want to just build yourself, you will have to first identify on what basis I can shard our data. So in this case of indexing, uh, you can shard by um, two ways. Um, so you can shard by this way. So you can actually shard by the boxes itself, uh, or you can shard by pin number of the place or something like that. But much easier is to shard by the box itself. Suppose if I divide this boxes into um, like say for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different boxes. Now the problem uh, that of the storage of the data is that in a machine we can simply save only this much of the data. So we have divided the data into eight pieces and all we, ha all we need is eight different machines where I can save this individual piece of data. So consider this is one, two, three, four. The data will present in three, four and the eighth machine. So this way we can chart this data over here and we can distribute the search based on where exactly that specific uh, uh, point present and then we can collect the query. Or you can do other way. You can spread the queries, like it's like scatter the query onto all of your shards and gather the results, whatever listing you get it. And then you can show that on your uh, web page as well. Um, so this is one way. The other way is you can find where exactly that point present and you can query that specific shard and then result, uh, you can search this query. So this you need some mechanism to do this. So you might need a proxy server, which basically understands all of these shards. Uh, it's something, looks something like a range based sharding itself, right? Um, so all of these, the, the points belong to this particular box or the range is here and here and here and here. So if this proxy knows that, it can automatically redirect and then uh, respond back with the result. If it doesn't know that, uh, it doesn't have that understanding, then you can scatter it and then gather it and then show that result as well. Um, otherwise, if you don't really want the proxy, what you can also do is you can your client can uh, understand how many shards are there and you can query itself. Uh, query every shard and then get the result as well. But that's not the really ideal way to do it uh, because clients shouldn't be knowing about what, what's happening in the backend. So all of this is the backend. Client will just talk to the proxy and the proxy will uh, query the respective shard and get the result back. Now, it's all good, but what happens if one of the shard goes down? Then we need the reliability. What could be done is you can distribute this, this data into other servers as well. Um, say a copy of this data can be saved here, maybe here, if your replication factor is three, that means that we always need to have three copy of the data. So two's copy is here, two's copy is also here, and one's copy we can save it here, one's copy we can save here as well. So basically every uh, uh, server will have its primary responsibility that it will serve always 
this the data for this one and it also keeps a copy of second one and then maybe eighth one so you basically distribute the data into other servers as well so every uh, machine will have three set of data one is primary responsibility and the second one the other two is just for the backup purpose or you can design in a way that um, this particular shard will take care of uh, searching queries for one two and eight as well if your proxy knows that um, that this uh, this shard can uh, provide the search facility for all of these three it can either search here or it can search here or here so two data is here as well here as well and here as well so it can either send that query to here or here or here based on uh, what is the load on each server so if it knows that this is heavily loaded it can actually redirect the query for shard number two to the shard number one where it also has the data which can use this server which is less uh, heavily loaded so it's fine so we can do this way um, yeah so now what happens about the consistency um, suppose if we really want to keep this system consistency two ways um, when the when the when we when the data is updated into this shard we can synchronously replicate to this and this copies and then we can send back the response that write successful but if we look at our design we don't really have a consistency uh, requirement because what happens if um, one if we up updated the restaurant's detail uh, it's okay if it is visible after a couple of seconds uh, it's fine so in that case we don't need to have a synchronous replication between this shard and this one this one we can make a synchronous replication so the queries the uh, the writes will be much faster because it doesn't have to wait until the writes to this shard is replicated to other shards so that way it is much faster as well so i guess I have pretty much covered the very important concepts uh, in this yelp system design but rest of all of the design is somewhat similar maybe if you want to have a user profile management order management or if you want to place an order to the delivery guy or whatever you want to have the requirement that's all th that those requirements are already covered in all of the other system design you can basically use those uh, design and incorporate and make your own design um, for help for even bigger uh, requirements so i guess uh, this was pretty interesting for me uh, as well uh, I, I hope you guys also enjoyed this one uh, if you like this one uh, hit a like button and um, share with your friends about this channel and yeah thanks a lot